Welcome, everybody, uh, once more to this um, IU uh, official conference series. Uh, this is uh, about massive stars, and um, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to, to start this new season, uh, introducing uh, Alquiste Bonanos. Um, he is presently research director at the Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Space Application and Remote Sensing at the National Observatory of Athens. And uh, she has been leading, or maybe she's still leading the ERC project access. Probably there will be things to, to just finish. Uh, what is uh, what uh, she is going to talk about today? And before moving to uh, Athens, uh, she spent one year in the Space Telescope uh, Science Institute uh, as a Yaconi Fellow, and then three years at the Carnegie Institution of Washington as a Vera Rubin Fellow. So yeah, the usual situation where we have to move a lot before uh, uh, consolidating our careers. And um, yeah, she obtained the PhD in astronomy in 2005. So it's the same year as, as, as me. We are colleagues. Uh, at uh, Harvard University about accurate distances to nearby galaxies. And I can briefly summarize, uh, even you, many of you uh, will know already, the, uh, her research interest is massive stars, uh, variability, extragalactic distances, uh, and hypervelocity stars, and um, also these episodic mass loss in evolved massive binaries uh, that uh, she will be uh, telling us uh, about today. So um, whenever you want, uh, Alquiste, uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sergio, for the introduction. So, and for the invitation to give the seminar, it's a pleasure to present the ASSESS project. It actually finished at the end of August. So, um, although with these projects, it's kind of strange because they finish, but they're still continuing because these things, you know, there are still papers that are being written up and things like that. So, um, yeah, the project ran over actually six years. So it's five years plus one year extension. It started in September, 2018, and it just ended. And here's a teaser. This picture here shows the great dimming of Betelgeuse, which I'll get to later on in the talk. Now, the motivation for the SS project had to do with objects such as Eta Carina, as you see here, uh, and the fact that such uh, LBV eruptions and pre-supernovae eruptions are a major unsolved problem in astrophysics. This is a quote from the review paper by Nathan Smith in 2014. Uh, the Although, yeah, the physical mechanism is not understood nor accounted for in evolutionary models. And obviously, uh, it seems quite important to get right in order to be able to predict what these stars do, how they evolve and how they end their lifetimes. Also, there's overwhelming evidence that it that uh, episodic mass loss occurs even at low metallicities. Uh, so it's important for the early universe. Now, this figure here showing the mass loss rates versus luminosities illustrates our understanding of mass loss rates at least 10 years ago. And for solar metallicity, uh, the plot uh, shows mass loss rates for theoretical values and empirical prescriptions used in models. So for various types of stars, we have O stars over here. Uh, the Yager divided by three divided by 10. We have red supergiants, yellow supergiants, wolf Rayet stars, LBV winds. Then there are LBV giant eruptions at the top and binary Roche lobe overflow. Now these are very approximate locations of mass loss rates occurring uh, during such events. Uh, the silver line indicates the limit uh, from line driven winds over here. So you can't exceed that from line driven winds. You need some other mechanism. Um, and this, as I said, is at solar metallicity. At other metallicities, the situation is more uncertain. Now, the SES project set out to answer some questions, such as what is the frequency of major mass ejections like Eta Carina? How does the frequency depend on metallicity? Um, what are the mass loss rates for red supergiants and their metallicity dependence? Uh, things like B bracket E stars, what is their evolutionary status? And in general, what's the role of episodic mass loss in the evolution of massive stars? Now, there's a lot of evidence, both from the massive star community and the supernova community, that such events are occurring. From the massive star community, for example, there are detections of circumstellar shells around several uh, stars. Uh, on the left is a picture from Guadalajara et al. 2010. There are actually two papers that came out that year. Uh, what stir et al. 2010 was the other one. They both did something similar. They've discovered nebulae from Spitzer data in our galaxy. 
And then they took spectra of the central stars and found them to be evolved massive stars, such as LBVs and wolf Rayet stars. Now, zooming in on some um, stars like Betelgeuse, red supergiants in the Milky Way, where one can resolve them, uh, we also see evidence for some kind of uh, episodic or some mass loss event. There are... Um, all these nebula are not symmetric, obviously, and there's a central disk here from one data set and uh, extended nebula reaching uh, or exceeding even 100 AU from the star. So there's all this evidence that stars are losing mass via strong stellar winds or instant or some short outbursts. Now from the supernova community, there's also evidence um, from interacting supernovae. So they have spectra that exhibit narrow emission lines generated by the interaction between the supernova blast wave and the dense circumstellar material that's ejected by the stellar progenitor before the final explosion. So for example here, uh, this is a type 2N 2009 IP, which went underwent a first outburst in 2009 and it was named a supernova, but in the end, that wasn't the supernova explosion, the final explosion. There was a second one and a third one, which seems to be the actual... Uh, explosion that blew up the star. Um, so these kind of imposters um, are, are showing uh, such uh, such uh, episodic mass loss events. Um, the mechanism is not understood. And these can also are also happening at low metallicities, which is very intriguing. Now, we take advantage here, uh, when the SS project, we take advantage of the fact that, that mass losing stars uh, form dust and are bright in the mid-infrared. So this is based on work we had done in 2009. Uh, the CMD on the left, uh, mid-infrared CMD, shows uh, stars in the LMC with known spectral types. So we find here that the most luminous ones at the 3.6 micron band are red supergiants, here in red with these red inverted triangles, Supergiant B bracket E's and LBV's, the black circles. Um, also, if you look at the SEDs of some of these objects, there's some very strange ones, like this object X that was found by Khan et al. 2011. It's the bright, it's the most luminous source in M33, but it hadn't been discovered till we looked in Spitzer, till we looked in the mid infrared. And the SED is very similar to the famous VAR A in M33 and IRC plus 10420, uh, sorry, 10420, right, in the Milky Way. Um, so these are dust entrusted objects. Um, and the, the object X has been shown to be a super symbiotic binary, so a cool hypergiant with an OB companion. So there's something going on with these, and um, we wanted to um, investigate this episodic mass loss. So the, uh, this project was also timely because there's a, a lot of um, Spitzer photometric catalogs available um, in, the, in, in databases and archives. So the goal of the project, and here's the team at the beginning, 2019, this is what the team looked like back then. Uh, so the lines of attack were, for example, first to develop a, a machine learning classifier to automatically find, to help find these evolved massive stars more easily. Um, second, to, um, to do an observational campaign, observing campaign to obtain spectra of a thousand dusty evolved mass stars. So the idea is to get a large sample, to have a lot of LBVs, a lot of uh, um, red supergiants, et cetera, to be able to get statistics on each type. Then to derive the parameters for these stars by spectral energy distribution modeling and stellar atmosphere, mod stellar atmosphere modeling to measure the parameters and their mass loss. And then to compare with ev evolutionary models. And the goal was to do also reverse engineering of stars to determine mass loss rates. Now the team has evolved in 2022 at the IAU meeting in Ireland. This is uh, the group, although at that point, Frank had moved on uh, I think that was the only change. Yeah, the rest were part of assess. Okay, uh, there have been several these nine papers, main let's say main assess papers um, submitted. The last one, Manus said he's submitting today, so I have it to be submitted, but it's almost ready. And there are also another five that are to be submitted by the end of the year. So I'll try and go through them, which is actually an impossible. Well, impossible. I'll try and point out some of the highlights from these papers. 
Now, uh, this is, I'll start with a machine learning classifier that uh, Grigoris Maravellas led uh, this work. Um, so the idea was uh, to, to use M31 and M33, uh, compile catalogs of known massive stars in these galaxies, since there are quite a few known, and then use photometric use indices, photometric indices or colors as features in the machine learning uh, algorithms. So we grouped the known stars into seven classes. So blue, red, yellow, supergiants, B bracket E stars, LBVs, Wolfrayet. And then a we had a, a class of outliers such as background galaxies and quasars. And uh, we created, we built this ensemble classifier which used the colors. Uh, there were three machine learning algorithms that were used, as you can see here, support vector classification, random forests, and multilayer perceptron. And these were combined, the probabilities from each one was combined to get the final result. Uh, overall, the accuracy of the classifier was found to be 83%. Red supergiants do better. Uh, they're recovered at around 94% accuracy. And when we applied the classifier to some other galaxies, like IC1613, WLM, and Sextant A that had no massive stars in them, we got an accuracy of 70%. And this discrepancy is very likely due to the different metallicity and extinction effects of these galaxies, because our training sample was M31 and M33, which uh, are more metal, metal rich. Okay, now the next step here, and this is work in prep that uh, Grigori is really hoping to submit within October, will submit in October, yes, uh, is uh, applying this classifier to over a million sources in 26 galaxies spanning a range of metallicities. So you can see the breakdown here uh, of well, the galaxies and actually the classified sources, the ones that were accurately classified, uh, that have a probability of the classification being greater than, forget the exact number, probably 60% or something. Uh, so here we have uh, good predictions for more than 275,000 sources. Uh, there's six types of massive stars and this, there's the category galaxy in 21 galaxies here shown here. So this is work that's forthcoming. Uh, for example, there's a CMD here, some CMDs for M33. So taking these classified stars, putting them on the CMD to see if they make sense. They do seem to. There's been also, I should mention, Gaia cleaning to remove foreground sources, but some do creep through because the Gaia had there's no data available for all the sources. Uh, so these very, very luminous ones are probably foreground ones, but the rest seem to make sense. The blue supergiants in blue, yellow supergiants fall here, red supergiants. But I should mention that AGBs and red supergiants here have not been uh, distinguished, so we probably have, we have AGB stars as well. Okay, moving on to the observing campaign. We have targeted 10 galaxies in the south with the VLT and Force 2. Uh, what we did is, because the classifier wasn't ready yet, we, we used mid-infrared colors to do our target selection. So we created and developed a prior, um, priority system for selecting our targets, um, with highest priority given to the ones that are redder and more luminous, so the ones in these boxes. We also had criteria depending on if there are optical sources detected in at least one band or more bands. So that's why you get all these various priorities. Um the here, this is an example of NGC 300, so the CMD and the sources with circles are the ones that we placed slits on. Okay, as you can see, the galaxies here span a range of metallicities, with sextant A being the most metal poor and M83 being the most metal rich. We obtained 956 spectra, so we had our priority stars, which were actually only 384. This is multi-object spectroscopy. So you place as many of your high priority objects as you can, and then you have empty slits available. So rather than leaving them blank, we added filler stars, as we call them, um, trying to have stars that had spitzer photometry as well to increase our chances of getting uh, things that are interesting. Uh, and here is the breakdown. We have, were able to classify 550, 541 stars. Among these are 185 evolved massive stars. And the largest group turned out to be red supergiants, so 129 red supergiants. The original project aimed to do LBVs and all these kinds of things, but it turned out it turned to red supergiants in the end because uh, we didn't have enough statistics for the rest. So in this plot from uh, our paper, the main catalog paper, let's say for the southern uh, sample, is there's a CM, there's two CMDs here in mid infrared and 
let's say near infrared as well, showing the various targets. So the dotted line outlines the dusty uh, priority targets. So there are quite a few targets and a lot of red supergiants, the red circles that were not in the priority system that we actually observed. Uh, but that's interesting because we get to compare a sample of dusty versus non-dusty red supergiants and compare their properties. In the table on the right, uh, you can see the breakdown per galaxy. We have the largest number of red supergiants in NGC 55 and NGC 300. Blue supergiants are just a handful, and yellow supergiants, LBVs, b Ease are so rare, they're just one or two in some of the galaxies. So there's not much statistics we could do with those. But we did increase the sample. We had uh, three new supergiant B-Brecketies, if I remember, and six new LPVs, or the opposite. I think Grigori will know. Um, OK, so oh, yeah, three LBVs and six supergiants. I've written it in my comments. So here are some uh, spectra, just to give you an idea of the quality of the spectra that we had to work with. The top left panel shows the red supergiants. The bottom left, the yellow supergiants. Um, and the, the red supergiants are ordered by spectral type, going from early to late, uh, from early K to, let's say, later M types. The yellow supergiants here, you can see high, some have H alpha and emission, some in absorption. They have oxygen here in absorption. And then you have the supergiant B brecades and LBV candidates. Of course, we, we call them candidates, uh, which have iron two emission lines, oxygen emission, calcium, calcium, forbidding calcium two lines, for example, really, really strong here in the supergiant B brecades. So um, three new LBVs, others were known and these are five uh, five of the six uh, LBVs that we uh, sorry sorry supergiant B brecades that we found. Now moving to the north, we applied to get time with uh, Osiris on GTC as well. This uh, these proposals were partially completed. They were ranked B, I think, so they didn't get fully observed. Here we had 90 priority stars in three galaxies, NGC 6822, IC10, and IC1613. All of these have low metallicity. And here we, out of the 182 extracted spectra, because once again, we had filler stars, uh, we had 125 classified stars, and among these 29 red supergiants, which let's say are the most interesting uh, for Massive, for massive stars. And here are some example spectra. This is from uh, Stefan's paper that's in prep, also to be submitted very soon. Um, okay, so this is uh, the analysis of the red supergiant sample from the Southern galaxies that were, that's already been published. So that's Stefan's paper that came out this year. In the left, we just show luminosity versus radius plot for the 90 or so red supergiants that we could get luminosities for from SED fitting, uh, showing a nice curve here, curved fit. Now, what's really interesting is the really high luminosity ones because there's the HD limit, which is around 5.8, although uh, there have been works on the LMC and M31 showing that it might be, suggesting that it might be lower, around 5.5. So we show both lines here. Uh, we also plot WHG64. That's an extreme red supergiant in the LMC, which I'm going to get back to later in this talk. And there are several stars around it. Now, it might be due to a distance effect. Some of these come from distant galaxies, and their distances are not known so accurately. But these are, in any case, really, really luminous and worth uh, worth to be followed up. Um, so yeah, we I should say that we modeled 127 of the 129 red supergiants to had artifacts and we couldn't model them in these galaxies. Um, the, and the other 29 are being um, yeah written up. Here is the CMD showing only the red supergiants this time, uh, and the one the box here on the right shows let's say a zoom in on the priority regions, the dusty region, so within the the dashed lines. Um, the spitter photometry that makes this plot uh, comes from about 20 years ago or, some, or so, whereas the spectral types that are color-coded here are from our spectroscopy in 2020, 2021. So we point out four stars that have uh, early K, that have K-type uh, classifications. Now, in this part of the diagram, the CMD, you expect these uh, dusty sources to have late spectral types. And to find these early spectral types are was um, a bit intriguing. 
And the way to explain it uh, is that this sample must have undergone either some mass loss ejection or perhaps there are Levesque massive variables that are changing. Uh, these have been found in low metallistic galaxies and uh, these were, I think these four also were from low metallistic galaxies. So this is, uh, these are targets to be followed up. Uh, so these are four out of our 33 stars that are in this box. So that means 12% of the K-type sample of our sample uh, experience was something like this, this episodic mass loss um, ejections. Uh, now, I should also mention that these very luminous red supergiants that also have mid-infrared variability, which I actually don't have time to go into that, but we did an analysis of the variability in the mid-infrared and also check the optical as well. And they have very similar properties to the progenitor of the late, the recent type 2P supernova 2023 IXF, which had a very obscured red supergiant progenitor. So it's very interesting. These very luminous are variable and um, then they explode. Okay, now moving on to another group of papers. <laughs> this is uh, on mass loss rates of red supergiants. So Ming Yang, who was a postdoc up till 20, I forget now, 21, I think. Um, no, 22. Um, he, yeah, gathered a large sample of red supergiants in the SMC, did his uh, cleaning from AGB stars as well as possible and had a clean sample of over 2,000 targets. So for these, the idea is to measure the mass loss rates. How did he do that? Uh, he collected 53 bands of photometric data spanning from the far UV to 24 microns, uh, and did dusty applied the dusty radiative transfer code, to, which estimates the mass loss rate. Um, here you can see some fits. The central source is assumed to be a Marx model, a red supergiant. Um, and you see some fits, some have low tau, some have higher optical depths and mass loss rates. Now there are several, um, several assumptions going into Dusty and Ming um, for, the, for the wind assumption made the assumption that it's a radiatively, radiatively driven wind. And I'm gonna come back to this uh, later. So the result here, so it's shown here in the mass loss rate versus luminosity plot. Every circle is a measurement of fit to the photometry for one red supergiant. It's the first time it's been done for such a large sample. And we found this relation that increases the higher mass loss rate with luminosity. And there seems to be a kink. So this was the new thing that was seen. Because uh, previous studies, and for example, the Yah here, which is using all the evolutionary models here, this orange line, and the Van Loon sample are based on a few dozen uh, stars, and usually extreme stars, not necessarily representative red supergiants. They're usually the more extreme uh, cases that were, and in the Milky Way that were found, and the Magellanic clouds. So all the lines here are um, mass loss rates from previous works. I mentioned the Yah here, Van Loon. We seem to agree with them, with Van Loon and uh, actually Van Loon and Feast, the best. Um, but we have this upturn at around log L of 4.6. Now, just to compare with uh, the previous the plot I showed you at the beginning, so we find something that agrees um, is a bit higher than the Yah here, closer to Van Loon, and it has an upturn. Just to put that into context. Okay, um, now we've continued this work uh, in the LMC. So Costa Sadoniadis led this work um, and again, assembled a careful, uh, carefully a source of uh, reliable targets, obtained the photometry and did the dusty modeling for all these sources. And here's the result once again. Uh, you have an upturn, but this time at uh, the kink seems to be at lower log L, about 4.4. Putting, so each dot we said is a, is a fit, a dusty fit to one red supergiant. These are shown on the right uh, com and compared to previous models. Now, Costas though did a very careful investigation of all the parameters and uh, found that uh, if you use the steady state winds, which seems to be more accurate for red supergiants, it lowers the rates by two to three orders of magnitude. So the previous result by Ming Yang is the red curve here. And now our result is down here. So actually that's quite a big change. And we seem to at least understand where it stems from. 
uh, previous works like Goldman, the ones that are up here are usually using the other assumption of radiatively, radiatively driven winds. Whereas if you use steady state assumption like Beezer, we tend to find these lower, lower rates. So that's one um, important um, result here and that we need to keep in mind. Uh, Costas is uh, what is on the is uh, expanding this work now to see how the mass loss rates depend on metallicity. Uh, so you want, we want to have a sample, a large samples in many galaxies with, of different metallicities. So SMC and LMC, uh, we, 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 we say we discussed. Uh, and you, well, LMC he did. Now with the same assumptions, the idea is to redo the SMC. Uh, NGC six A two two. Here we have. Um, low metallicity again, around 400 red supergiant candidates known, and also the Milky Way. We want to go to higher metallicity, but it turns that turns out to be a bit more difficult um, because in the Milky Way, you don't have very certain distances, and that means you have uncertain luminosities. Now, in the SMC, because as we did the, the work using the same exact assumptions as he did in the LMC, and he did a more careful selection and has fewer sources because he was stricter in the criteria that he used to, kept, to keep the sources. They had to have multiple detections in mid-infrared filters and found here this lower massless rate. So it starts at minus eight and goes up to about minus five with a kink again, the same as uh, the paper with, led by Ming Yang. For NGC 6A22, uh, this is work in prep. Um, he applied it to the 400 red supergiant candidates. Uh, 87 of these actually have James Webb photometry. So these have the orange circles. Um, some are... Are, and these tend to be much lower. Um, so that's the result there. Of course, there are fewer candidate, fewer, fewer stars, so you can't see the trends that well and the kink. Now for the Milky Way, also it's tough. There, as we said, there are uncertainties with the distances and the luminosity. So the luminosity errors might be larger. There might be systematics that are uh, not shown or not uh, seen here in the plot. Uh, th there's no evidence for a kink, and again, the massless rates seem to be lower. But this, uh, I think, the way forward uh, is to go to a galaxy, a distant galaxy like M83, that's high metallicity, and it has James Webb photometry, and do it there. I mean, it's harder to do in our galaxy than to do in, at four megaparsecs. So, putting all the results together, all the massless rates um, is this plot. So, different colors for different for the points from the different galaxies. And here, Costas is overplotted in red. Uh, massless rates de derived for some red supergiants uh, from gas diagnostics. This is from CO rotational lines. The work from Dessin, very recent work as well. And the uh, the good news is that they seem to agree with this the, uh, with these values over here. So there seems to be uh, an agreement between the dust massless rates and the gas mass loss rates. Um, so this is the largest sample of red supergiant uh, mass loss rates in different galaxies studied. Um, there is this evidence for this kink, which needs to be explained. And there no, does not seem to be a strong correlation with metallicity, but this needs to be examined further. Okay, moving on now to the paper led by Manus Apartas, the one that's to be submitted today. Um, this Manus now took four mass loss rate prescriptions and applied them within the Poseidon platform, so in MESA models, uh, to see what the result is. So if we use the Yang et al. prescription that, or that the Yang here, the Beezer and the key prescriptions, which the K1 I didn't mention, but it's an analytical prescription based on turbulent winds. Um, these are color coded here. Uh, and he's produced this plot of the, the luminosity function versus luminosity. Uh, we compare the predictions uh, from MESA for each of these uh, mass loss prescriptions and compare it to the gray lines, which are the observed from the observe the measurements of the 2000 red supergiants in the SMC. So this is all done for SMC, SMC metallicity. Uh, the key results with, uh, they seem to be stripping, their, their very high mass loss rates, they seem to be stripping the stars too much and there are fewer red supergiants very few red supergiants produced here in this luminosity range. The young one seems to agree here, but they're a bit underrepresented. They're fewer than, than uh, observed above log L of five. 
Beezer over predicts the number of red supergiants. So, so there's none of the prescriptions that actually match the results perfectly, but there are lessons to be learned from all of this. And you can check, uh, well, the paper when it comes out soon. And Manos also produced this plot, uh, this HR diagram um, with the location. So the, the locations of the endpoints of the stars right before core collapse. So he's evolved them using these four different prescriptions and the blue is the young adult prescription. So if we use that prescription, the red supergiant should be found here at higher masses. There shouldn't be a red supergiant. The finals, they should explode um, as yellower stars here. So it predicts that stars explode as yellow supergiants. Uh, if we follow the Beezer Maslow's prescription, then um, the higher masses, well, what happens here, you have them exploding as red supergiants, although a little bit warmer ones. And then the squares are black hole implosions. So you have the stars reaching these locations and imploding. And yeah, so you have the various tracks here. The key ones, they don't, they, they're, they're yellow supergiants, they, blue or yellow. They don't even reach the red. They've been stripped too much. So uh, this, oh yeah, I should say the 2D, this histogram takes into account the, and it's been weighted with the star formation history of the SMC and the IMF of the stellar progenitors. So um, yeah, and also they've been overplotted, our actual 2P, 2L, and 2B progenitors, the locations of the progenitors, and they have large error bars, of course, but these are where we actually see the stars exploding, and here's where MANA predicts them to be exploding if you assume these uh, mass loss rate prescriptions. So for sure, more work needs to be done in this, but this is a, a way forward showing how important it is to uh, implement um, correct mass loss rates in these evolutionary models. Moving on now uh, to evolved massive stars in the Magellanic Clouds. This is only one slide from Stefan's 2023 paper, where we got some spectra of um, evolved massive stars in the LMC and SMC and found some red supergiants, also in LBV. Um, and I want to point out here this very luminous red supergiant. It's actually called W60B90. It's an M3 red supergiant. And it's an analog of this red hypergiant WOH with very high radii and luminosities. So what intrigued us to study it further was this archival image shown on the right from HSD. Um, we happened to find that it, there's this bar feature uh, which re is reminiscent of Betelgeuse, which also has a bar feature. Now, Betelgeuse is much closer. It's a runaway star, and it's known to have a bow shock. And we were wondering if W60B90 also has a bow shock. Now, from an analysis of the Gaia data, we found the proper motion of the star to be in this direction, depending on various assumptions. It is moving towards this bar. Um, we also obtained spectroscopy with Magellan um, you can see the slits that we placed, the, the gray ball, uh, rectangles are the, where the slits were placed. And measured, we measured the sulfur over H alpha line. If it's above 0.4, it's evidence for shock material. And interestingly, we found evidence for shock material between the star and the, and the bar. Uh, because the star is so bright, we cannot see the bow shock, but we, we think there's a lot of evidence that, that it probably is there. And you need some kind of coronagraph to block the star in order to see the bow shock. Uh, it's also consistent with the proper motion, right, and the expected location of the, of the bow shock. So just to briefly show that work from Gonzalo's paper. Uh, now, if it's an analog of Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, as we know, underwent this dimming event in 2020. It decreased by 1.25 magnitudes over a few months. Uh, the mass loss rate was about this 3 to 120% of the annual mass loss of Betelgeuse. It, uh, its shape was uh, observed to change like this, and as you can see from this VLT data. And it was explained uh, as a convective plume that was uh, anomalous. It, it, they're not very commonly generated, but they do occur in a turbulent envelope. They can It rose and broke free from the surface, uh, and that became a, basically a surface mass ejection. So this one of these convective plumes that happened in these convective atmospheres of these red supergiants was very strong uh, with the turbulence it was released. And this is where we come back to the cartoon I showed in the initial slide, showing uh, 
this plume uh, being ejected as it gets farther dust forms. Uh, and if that happens to be in the line of sight of Earth, then you see a darkening. Now, uh, Gonzalo collected a light curve, a 30 year light curve for W60B90, uh, shown in the top here from Macho, Asus, Ogle 3, Ogle basically, Gaia, Assassin, and Atlas. And the bottom plot is just subtracted a median value for each light curve in order to compare the three light curves. We also obtained spectra, but I'm not going to go into that, uh, where the vertical lines are, are shown. And interestingly, uh, he found we found three dimming events here in 99, 2011, and 2022. So over here, 2011 and 2022. We compare it with Betelgeuse, but the Betelgeuse dimming was much narrower. Um, it took about 200 days to recover, whereas the one um, for W60B90 took about 400 days. The magnitude delta V was about one magnitude versus 1.25. But interestingly, for W60B90, there's a recurrence period. It seemed to occur every 11.8 years. Um, now, we put all three here on the right. Let's just focus on the right plot first. All those three, if you overlay them, they actually have a very similar shape. And that was intriguing. So that led us to look for um, data for other red supergiants. There was a red super There was a dimming event that had been reported by Anugu. This in the paper, I think it had not come up yet, but Gonzalo retrieved the data and are showing it here. Um, Musep as well had a dimming event, um, not very well known, I think. Uh, and this led us, to, and, and the shapes were very very similar. Uh, this led us to look uh, at the radii of the stars. Why are these shapes so regular? Does it have to do with the size? So in the LMC, since you know the distance well, you can obtain the radius quite uh, with quite high accuracy, whereas the other three are galactic and the radii are, are uncertain. As you see with Betelgeuse, there's a very large range. Uh, our WSEP is but also MUSEP. We didn't find a good error bar, but anyway. Um, so the question is, does the rise time depend on the size of the star? If it has to do with this convective... Um, cells be coming up, perhaps it has to do with the size, and then in order for the star to readjust itself, uh, a bigger um, convective cell will disrupt the star more and it will take longer for it to recover. So that's the idea. So how common how common are dimming, how common are dimming events among red supergiants? That's an open question that we want to follow up. And the other question is, if it depends uh, if, on the size of the star, then that's a way to measure um, the size. You know, if you have a dimming event, you can measure the size of the red supergiant, and then you can use that as a distance indicator. You can, if you know the size, you can get the luminosity. You can measure uh, luminosities of star of red supergiants in the Milky Way, which is very difficult to do. Finally, um, I want to tell you about WHG64, an exciting uh, system that we stumbled upon. We got some data for it and found that it has an extreme transition from the spectroscopy we found, that uh, the spectra we obtained uh, in 2021 showed that it has emission lines. It, it's been well known as an extreme, a very reddened uh, and late type red supergiant. So M7 or M6 for many, many years, and suddenly it has B brackety features. So we're trying to um, explain this. Uh, Gonzalo Gian found the assembled the thirty year light curve for this uh, object from Macho and Ogle, and you can see that initially it had very strong variability over two magnitudes. The amplitude was reduced later on during the Ogle data set, and so at some point in twenty fourteen, approximately, the blue color here increased by almost two magnitudes. The I band stayed about the same, but the blue made a big jump. So the star became bluer. Um, there was no outburst, no explosion. The light curve just stopped, seemed to stop pulsating, but there are some wiggles and some bumps in it still as we keep monitoring it. So this is the first time a late M type has been seen to transition to a supergiant B bracket E star. Uh, and it happened really, really fast. So on the bottom panel, we see a spectrum from 2007 over here, where it's an M5. And then the blue one is from X Shooter and uh, the magenta is from Mage from Magellan in 2021, where 
the 2016 one, which was closer to the transition, showed strong emission lines, everything in emission, forbidden lines and everything. And the mage one is showing our PCGNI profiles as things are settling down. Now, what's going on? Um, there are various uh, ideas we're putting forth. One is that it was an ejection of the outer layers of the atmosphere of a star, but the mechanism is unclear. The other idea is that uh, it's an LBV-like eruption due to the proximity to the Humphreys-Davidson limit. If the limit indeed is closer to 5.5, and this star is very close to that, so perhaps there's some uh, eruption, the star is becoming unstable. Um, it could be also a transition from optically thick to thin material as uh, previously ejected material disperses. For example, VA38MON had material that's you know eventually from 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 a previous merger event uh, will, will at some point become uh, optically thin, and perhaps that's what we witnessed. And the other idea is that it might be directly due to binary interactions um, from by a partial or total stripping of the envelope from common envelope or mass transfer. I should also mention that this star was found by by Onaka to have. Uh, circumstellar material in a torus-like shape and the mass was measured to be three to nine solar masses so there's definitely been some binary evolution in the past but we don't know if this transition it's not clear was directly related to that or it's something that followed the binary interaction okay i think i'm on time so i can even read the summary uh so this is the main results or the results so far from the erc assess grant it set out to be an ambitious survey of a thousand evolved massive stars and 27 galaxies spanning a range of metallicity to determine the role of mass loss. Uh, what we managed to accomplish was um, to uh, develop this photometric classifier and to provide classifications of evolved massive stars for over 270,000 evolved stars in 21 galaxies. Uh, we analyzed a large uh, spectroscopic data set from three telescopes and got parameters for 232 evolved massive stars, including 164 red supergiants in 15 galaxies. Uh, we've obtained a new uh, mass loss relation for red supergiants, which show that they have lower rates. There is an enhancement at high luminosity and this kink and not a strong metallicity dependence. Um, some of the highlights are that these, this is the largest catalog of evolved massive stars and of red supergiants at low metallicity beyond the local group. There are three new LBVs and six new supergiant V bracket E's. And then the two um, LMC red supergiants, W60B90, which seems to be a massive analog of Betelgeuse with a bow shock and dimming event, which we thought were rare, but apparently maybe they're not so rare. Uh, and also WHG64, which, which made this unique transition from extreme red supergiants to the blue. Um, so with that, I'll put the papers. Here's the team last year. Of course, we're continuously evolving, but uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Alkisti, for very this very nice example of an efficient teamwork. So congrats for all the results you have obtained during these uh, years. Uh, I have a couple of questions that we are almost, uh, 50 people, so I'm sure you will have uh, uh, questions by the audience. So if anyone wants to ask. No questions here. Or maybe I, I can start. Um, one of them is uh, I'm more uh, have more expertise on the blue. So how do you do to derive the mass loss rate in the red super giants? How do we derive it? Um... Yeah. With the dusty code, so basically, um, okay, I'll just explain it. So the dusty code does the radiative transfer. So if you, it assumes you have a atmosphere model, a Marx model, and then you have a shell of dust around, and it does the radiative uh, transfer through that. So you would expect more blue flux, but it's uh, reprocessed and emitted in the infrared. So it it models the shape of the CD. So you have more flux in the infrared if there's been, if there is dust. And there are a lot of assumptions like the dust grain size and things like that that go into it as well. So there are a lot of parameters to tweak. You do your best to tweak them to the values that are reasonable and uh, measure it. So is, is the set fitting and it's not that you have a diagnostic line in the spectrum? Is there... Exactly, it's SED fitting with dust. Yes, that's how we've done it, yeah. 
Okay, and then if uh, we don't have question, the other one is like, um, so I, I see the red super, super giant is like a transitional phase that is uh, long lived. Uh, but then um, I can imagine that in the last sample that you have compiled, you have stars that are going in one direction, going to the red super giant phase, and some of them are uh, uh, moving back blue. So is this something that you have started to explore? If there is some difference in two different population there, because I imagine that the structure of the star will be different, so there will be some differences, or, or this is an intuition that is not like that. Are you talking about the Zapata's modeling? Well, basi um, basically, it's they're not a transitional period necessarily, right? For the lower well, mass, I mean that, they... that in in the same kind of uh, band, the red super giant band, you are going to have some of the stars that are going in the direction from the blue to the red, and some of them are maybe departing from uh, from the red super giant. So, right, is, is there you begin to see kind of. Um, by moral distribution of properties that can tell you something or well, we didn't have very many yellow supergiants in the sample but you would expect the ones that are post red supergiants to have more to be more dusty to have more uh, yeah high ma uh, yeah dust would be the the evidence for some mass loss or, that happened during that transition okay but we don't have very much data on that uh, we do well, from Grigori Maravella's paper, from the predicted yellow supergiants by the classifier, the idea is to look at the ones that are dusty from there versus regular ones. Yeah. We're looking into that. Okay. Any question from the audience? Good opportunity to ask uh, Alkeste Riverly. I think Lee has Maybe everybody is really tired after submitting many people. <laughs> Hungry. Or also hungry. Okay. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, surely. Go ahead. Uh, just just on this on this red super giant that's kind of moved across to being a something else. Uh, you, you you mentioned there was evidence for a previous binary interaction with a with a Taurus or something like that. Would you could could you say a little uh, more on that? Uh, right. So Onaka had um, measured it, had resolved it with Vizier observations, if I remember correctly, in the near infrared. And they modeled that. Um, and they modeled that and they found the mass in that nebula was of three to nine solar masses. That's what's known. That's the fact that's known. Now, evolutionary models, uh, no one I think is really. I don't know if they're. I don't think their papers uh, with scenarios of what's uh, trying to put it all together. We're trying to do this, but we have not been able to narrow it down to one. It seems to be several options are still open. Yeah. I'm coming by Manos. Maybe Manos, you want to comment yourself early. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what uh, Algisti mentioned that for the post red supergiant uh, phase, we would expect also to have different mass and different surface gravities in case we we could uh, measure this. Because if it's a post red supergiant, it lost a lot of mass uh, to leave the red supergiant phase. Okay, and then one question regarding the, because you, you have a very nice sample of uh, stars in different, different galaxies. So, so if maybe you mentioned in the, in the talk, but could you elaborate a bit further? What is the, if you have seen any dependence on metallicity or, or how is the situation? With the mass loss rate for, for stars in different, uh, yeah, this one. So this one, yeah, we have LMC with the blue circles, SMC with the orange, and Milky Way is the higher metallicity, say further down. Um, the thing with the kink, I mean, when we had the LMC, when we had the we had the SMC result with the kink at uh, four point six, and then the LMC with the kink at four point four, and we thought they were that would continue. That's not clear. It have it does continue, but we need better data. And yeah, we thought it would be easier to do an M thirty an M thirty one, but uh, the Spitzer data, the mid infrared data there from Spitzer is too contaminated. It turns out, 
So mm-hmm. you really need uh, James Webb data, but James Webb can't observe such a big galaxy on the sky, right? So then you need to go farther away so James Webb can observe it and have enough red supergiants in it. So it seems like the sweet spot is in several megaparsecs away. We can't do it very close. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So maybe if we don't have questions. Anyway, the, the talk as usual will be uh, put in YouTube, the recorded version. So if you have any question uh, afterwards for, for Alkiste, I'm sure she will be happy to, to answer. So thank you very much, Alkiste, for this very nice summary of our results and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.